Thank you. Unfortunately, I won't be doing any singing for you. Uh, maybe tonight, we'll see. Um, yeah, I'm here to talk about my Google Summer of Code project that I did along with uh, Conrad, where we expanded the Swift Java intro. So my primary goal of the project was expanding the way that we can call Swift from Java. So why should we even call Swift? Why do we even care? Besides the fact that we can, well, sometimes in Java we need very uh, performant code, and the JVM has quite a bit of overhead. So Java has uh, built-in support for calling down to native languages such as C and C++. Now we all know that Swift is the safer alternative to C and C++. It gives us the safety, but still gives us the near native performance that we expect. On top of that, we have a large ecosystem of already available Swift packages for Linux and iOS. So why shouldn't we be able to take those and use them on platforms like Android? Last year at this exact conference, the Swift team announced the Swift Java library. Now, the Swift Java library includes several tools for interrupting between Swift and Java in both directions. In this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the jextract tool. Now, the jextract tool is a command line tool and also a build plugin. It will automatically take your Swift sources, analyze them, and extract Java APIs that you can call from Java. You can pack this up in a jar or an Android package and throw it in your project. Now, this um, a tool, jextract, it was launched with what is called the Foreign Functions and Memory API, also known as FFM. Now, this is a re relatively new API added to Java, and it gives the developer approved control over interacting with native memory. It is the replacement and safer alternative for the Java native interface that we have known since the beginning of Java. So it gives us better performance and safety. So What's the catch? This sounds pretty great for us as Swift developers, performance and safety. So why can't we just use this? Well, let's take a look at the JEP for the foreign functions and memory API. We see that it was actually released in Java 22. Now that's a quite recent Java release, which is fine for server platforms. You can probably update your Java version, no problem. But that means no Android support. That's quite a bummer. With all the cool stuff that we've been working on with the Android Working Group and the Android SDK, we still need tools that allow us to actually use our Swift code on Android, not just compile them. Well, I'm very excited to announce that during this summer, Conrad and I um, successfully achieved adding a new mode to the JExtract tool. It's the JNI mode. So the JNI mode uses the Java native interface instead of the FFM. So that means that we can support Java 11 and above, which also means that we can actually have Android compatibility. So while the FFM mode is more meant for modern platforms and servers, the JNI mode is more of a legacy uh, mode that you can enable to run it on platforms such as Android. Now that means that we will probably take a bit of cost on the performance, making more copies between the JVM and the native memory. But a cool thing is that we achieved quite a wide set of features available in the JNI mode compared to the current FFM mode. Let's take a look at some Java code. I know, don't close your eyes, it's just Java. So we've got a person class where we're declaring variables, calling functions. We uh, even have like something that looks like a switch statement. We're able to extract associated values. We even have like a closure, lambda. And at the bottom we have a generic function. This is quite common Java code if you would ask any Java developer. Well, what if I told you that all the types that I'm highlighting now are actually Swift types? These are automatically extracted using the jextract tool from Swift. So that means that we have access to enums, we have access to protocols, methods, variables, and more. Pretty cool. So while we have support for all the basic stuff, like initializing structs, classes, calling methods, setting variables, getting variables, we also have added a bunch of cool stuff that the FFM mode does not have yet. So this is uh, things like protocols, opaque types, existentials, throwing functions, and uh, even enums. So of course the goal is at some point to have feature parity between the FFM and JNI mode. So if anyone is interested in contributing, we would be very welcome to uh, get you started and helping in on the project. Now, so all the basic stuff works. Let me take you on a small journey of how one of the more advanced features we added works. It's the enums. Consider this rather simple vehicle enum in Swift. So it can either be a bicycle or it can be a car. And the car can have an associated value of the maker of it. Now, 
when we extract this uh, Swift type using the J-extract tool, this is how we would be able to use it in Java. So we see here that we're able to switch over the actual caches of the enum in a way that's very similar to Swift. So we're able to extract easily the associated values in Java. And this is thanks to new JDK features like pattern matching and the fact that we're using specific types underneath the hood in order to get exhaustive switching over the enum. Now, if you had to write off this code by hand, this is all the code that you have to write. So this is all the code, the Java code, that is needed in order to wrap 10 lines of Swift. Sorry, I forgot all the Swift code as well you need to write. That's a bit more. So this is quite a big, a big amount of code. It's actually 368 lines of code that you need to write for 10 lines of Swift. So, well, with this tool, it's actually 368 lines of code you don't have to write because we do it for you. And on top of that, we're able to make performance improvements and safety uh, stuff that you would have to remember for every API that you needed to wrap otherwise. So this code is very hard to get right, and we can do it all for you. Let's zoom in a bit on the actual generated code. I've left out the actual implementation of the functions, but this is sort of what the Java code looks like that it extracts. Here we see we're using uh, Java features like the sealed interfaces and the records in order to get the exhaustive switching that I showed you before. Let's focus in a bit on the user. So we have a discriminator type. The discriminator type is what we use for, for, to be able to, for Swift to tell back to Java which case is the Swift enum actually in. So here we see that we're actually indexing into the discriminator.values type, which returns an array of all the possible values of the discriminator. This is sort of like the case iterable type that you have in Swift. Now, the index that we're using is the return value of this dollar sign get discriminator. What is that all about? It doesn't appear on the slide. Well, this is where all the magic happens. This is where we uh, define a native method in Java that, is that will be implemented in a native language such as Swift. We see here that we're passing in a long, which is called self, and we're passing in the value of a function called the memory address. Now, this is how, uh, this explains how the actual memory management between Java and Swift so, just to give you a quick overview of how it works, let's say that we're instantiating a car with an associated value. What happens underneath the hood is that the car function will make a native call, which is implemented in Swift, to allocate the type in the Swift memory space. What is returned to Java is actually just a pointer to the Swift type, so it's just an integer. The JVM, we will then uh, generate or allocate an object on the JVM, which stores a pointer. And this is what we will get back when we call the memory address. Now, this is the actual Swift code that is needed to implement this method. Here we're using the underscore C uh, attribute in order to give it a very specific name that the JVM knows to look for. Then we're uh, do using some existing logic from the Swift Java project in order to get out the pointer as an integer type, using the unsafe mutable pointer to actually access the underlying pointy, and then we can switch over the type and return the correct number. So once we have what type the Swift enum is in, we can switch over the discriminator and depending on the actual type, we can call functions that allow us to extract the associated values, such as the maker of the car. So that's the get as car function. The get, a, get as car function works in a similar way. It makes a down call into Swift using the native uh, function that we just saw, and this returns a J object. Now, a J object is just a pointer to an object in the JVM. And the reason that we're doing this is we're, we're using it to uh, pass back a box of values, which is the associated values. So here it's really a type called native parameters. So we can replace the J object with the native parameters for readability. So our Swift function will look at the Swift memory that we have uh, passed in. It will extract the associated value and it will use the J and I methods in order to allocate a JVM instance and passing in the associated values. We can then pass back this pointer to Java and the Java function can then extract the associated values and return it back to the user. This is the code for such a function. And I just want you to focus in on this part. This is the actual part where we are finding the class, uh, the actual class reference in the class loader, finding the correct method ID for the constructor, and calling the new object. So this is where we allocate. Now, these functions can be quite slow, because we are looking up the class loader, finding the class reference, and finding the correct constructor. And if we had to do this every time, it would be quite slow to do. Luckily, the pro of having a source generator is that we can generate caching for you. So, Actually, the code that we generate looks like this. It uses caching underneath the hood to cache the class references and the method IDs for quicker lookup. 
and it actually gives a performance improvement of 35%, which is quite a lot. So that was a lot of details about enums. I hope I just made the point across that this tool generates code that's a bit tricky to get right. The JNIA is a source of many boxes. We are able to generate code that is both performant and safe. And with the new JNI mode, we have able, we've been able to add multi-platform support for Android with the new Android SDK as well. So what's next? Well, we're very interested in talking about distribution. How can we distribute a Swift package as a JAR package or an Android library? How do we handle transitive dependencies? And the idea of writing an implementation of a protocol uh, in Java and passing it back to Swift. And what do we do about whole, the whole Swift concurrency? So if you're interested in any of these, please come join us at, on the GitHub page and, uh, or chat with me or Conrad after the, in the break. And you can also reach me on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for listening.